thank you for letting me spend some time with you guys this morning. So, my name is Stephen. Uh, I'm, by education, I'm a psychiatrist, an addiction psychiatrist. I have always been interested in the human brain and how different things affect the human brain. And so many years ago, I, I, I grew up on Long Island. I'm actually from the Midwest, Iowa. Um, grew up on Long Island. I went to college in Jersey, medical school in the Midwest. And I became a psychiatrist and I got my PhD in neuroscience and I decided I wanted to go into the research end of, of the business. So, stopped seeing patients a while ago and now all my patients are research subjects. I run an addiction research center at NYU in the School of Medicine. So, I'm an addiction research scientist. I'm not here to tell you that drugs are bad and, and don't do drugs. You don't need to hear that from me. You've heard it. You need, you'll hear it from people far more important than I am. So I'm not here to talk about how bad drugs are. I'm just here to show you some science. I do science in the addiction world. Um, just so we're all on the, on, the, on the same page, you're gonna see some images of people that have the disease of addiction. Some of them are from Brewster. It's not unique to Brewster. I live in West Hampton on the east end of Long Island. I have patients from West Hampton. I went to high school in Port Jefferson. I have patients from Port Jefferson. So, districts in the tri-state area all have this issue. Every drug that we've ever studied in the city is here. It's also in Long Island. So there's nothing unique about your district. I'm not here because you've got a problem that's worse than anywhere else. The problem's about the same. Different districts have more common other different drugs, but for the most part, every addictive drug we study is here, and it's where I live. So some of the patients are from here. And they could be patients that went through here five years ago. They could be patients who are here currently. You understand that we're all adults. These things happen. And this is the science I do. So my youngest patients in the center are fourth graders. They're nine years old. They're alcoholics. They're drinking a bottle, a bottle and a half of gin or vodka a day. They're this big. I have kids in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade who are addicted to opiates, heroin. They're injecting heroin under their tongue daily. These kids are 11, 12 years old. And I have people in their 80s who are addicted to methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is the most addictive drug we've ever seen. Anyone watch Breaking Bad? Right. Of course. So Breaking Bad compound he was making was methamphetamine. We'll talk about that a little later on. It's the most addictive drug we've ever seen. But we'll talk about it and we'll talk about some other things that we've been seeing. So, patients who come to my center come as volunteers. No one comes because they have to. People who come, come because they want to get involved in the research we do. It's no different than an, addicted, an Alzheimer's center or the lupus center. It's no different than any of those. Mine's just addiction. I've been interested in it for a really long time for a whole bunch of reasons. So we've been studying this disease, I've been studying for almost 40 years. The data you're going to see today are all published. You can Google it, you can read all about it. They're all in the scientific journals that we publish in. I'm not going to show you anything that hasn't been published. So, if you have any questions you can ask. There were some amazing questions in the last group. You can ask anything you want to ask. I've been doing this over a really long time. I've been asked questions forever. You can ask anything you want. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. I have two kids of my own. They're grown and gone. But I have my issues as a parent. We can talk about that. Um, so I'll try to make it as simple as I can. If I say something you don't understand or I use a word you don't understand, but you just don't believe what I'm saying, that's fine too. Right? The beauty of science is we put it out there and you read it, and you either agree with it or you don't. We have data that backs it up, but right, you're welcome to understand it or not understand it, believe it, not believe it. I'm just gonna show you some simple science. So, people who come to our center are volunteers. They have some addiction. We study all addictions. The most common patient we have is obese. Obesity is an addiction to food. And we have about 15% of our program are chemically dependent the different drugs that you've heard of. And then the biggest group not obese are the behavioral addictions. And we'll talk about those. We've experienced something in the last few years that changed everything for us. And I'm sure you will absolutely know what it is when we get there. 
So what we do is we study the human brain. Right? Addiction is a disease that's resident in your brain. It's a disease that we think you're born with. We, the youngest patient that's been published that we've recorded is a three-year-old who has the disease of addiction. She's not addicted to anything, but she's got the disease. We see the disease of addiction in the brains of people before they get addicted. Right? We spend a lot of time identifying kids who have the disease. We spend a lot of time looking for kids at risk. If it's truly a disease, and this is true of every disease, it represents a change in how your body lives, not how your body looks. So these imaging techniques that you see up there on the screen, CT, X-ray, and MR, these are anatomical imaging techniques. They take pictures of your anatomy, what you look like. A disease is the manifestation of changes in how you live, not how you look. So, for the science people, a disease is a change in physiology, not anatomy. That means those cameras help us when a disease has advanced far enough, right? How do we diagnose cancer? Really one of two ways. We feel a mass or we become symptomatic of one. In either case, by the time you feel it or by the time you're symptomatic of it, the disease is substantial. That means the disease has to exist before you get sick. Right? Because when you have a tumor that you can finally feel, it's been there for months before, you just weren't symptomatic of it. That means every single disease that's out there has to exist in your body before you get sick. So if we have a tool, a camera, that allows us to see diseases before you get sick, that provides an enormous advantage to us in treating it. That's what we do with addiction. We see it in brains of kids before they get addicted. Because we know that the single greatest way to prevent it from happening is to educate kids that they have it so they won't engage in behaviors that unmask it. What we know about addiction is if it's in your brain, if you have it, behaviors are going to bring it out. What we say, the term we use is unmask. People who have the disease, the disease of addiction in their brains unmask it as a consequence of their behavior. Now, before we, once we say that, we always got to make sure that we're clear, because what people have been telling me for 40 years is that you did it to yourself, it's all your fault, it's because of your parents or the kids you hang out with. None of that's true. People who have the disease of addiction unmask it by doing things we all do. Number one addiction in the world is obesity. We all eat. Everybody eats. So nobody gets up in the morning and says, I want to be addicted to something, or I want the disease. Nobody. What happens is you engage in behaviors that everyone engages in, and if you have the disease of addiction in your brain, it shows up. It unmasks. Now we see it, and we measure it, and we spend two days a week identifying kids at risk, and we educate them, and it's really simple. Type 2 diabetes is a classic example. That's a disease that's the manifestation of gaining too much weight. If you have type 2 diabetes and you keep your BMI around 25, it never shows up. The problem is, as you age, you gain weight, and it shows up. And then all of a sudden, you've gained a little too much weight, and now you're a type 2 diabetic. Well, you've got two things. You can either lose weight, or you can start losing insulin. If you lose weight, the disease is checked, kept in balance. Addiction is the same way. If you have it in your brain and you engage in behaviors that are mastic that we all do, it shows up. Now, unfortunately, unlike type 2 diabetes, we can't manage addiction with weight. Now we need to manage and treat it. And we can. It's a disease that we can manage and we can treat once you express it. So we'll talk about some things that express it, and we'll talk about some behaviors that are consistent with it, and I'll show you the effects of addictive substances and behaviors on the brain. The way we measure or we look at patients is we use something called a PET scanner, PET. It's an acronym that stands for Positron Emission Tomography. It is a functional imaging technique. It shows us how your body lives, not how it looks. It's a physiologic imaging technique, not an anatomical imaging technique. It shows me function, not anatomy. So I see diseases before anybody gets sick. We see Alzheimer's disease in kids who are 17 years old. These are kids who come and volunteer to our center, and they're normal controls, they don't have the disease of addiction, they just controls. You see Alzheimer's disease. 
We see schizophrenia, we see depression, bipolar disorder, we see Parkinson's, we see Huntington's, we see cancers all the time. Because we have this tool that lets us see how your body lives. That has a lot of responsibility, right? We've got to deal with the patient who comes in who's 17 years old, who's of normal control, and all of a sudden we see Alzheimer's disease in his brain. A disease that isn't going to show up for 50 years, but we see it. So this is the power of this instrument. It's the power of the technology that we now have where we can see diseases before people get sick. That's going to be really important because if we, the greatest way to prevent addiction is to educate kids in the front end so they don't engage in behaviors that bring it out. PET scans are presented in color. They're the only imaging technique in medicine that we present in color. The color scale we use is the rainbow scale. Everybody knows what the rainbow scale is. Where do you live? When you look at a single slice of a human brain, parts of the brain that appear bright red are parts that are very, very active. Yellows and greens are less active. Blues and blacks not active at all. So if I put all of you in a PET scanner right now and I got a picture of your brain, it takes eight minutes. It's non-invasive. It doesn't hurt. You just lay still for eight minutes, I get a picture. What I would see is the back part of your brain, back here, eyes are on top, would be bright red because we all see from the back of our brain. The part of your brain that's right here, where you see this bright red spot, is where you all hear from. So that part of your brain would be bright red because you're listening. So it's simple. So we can do a lot of things. We can, if I put you in a PET scanner and I put a tennis ball in your left hand and you squeeze that tennis ball for the eight minutes the scan takes, at the end of the scan, I'll see the part of your brain that runs your left hand. I can have you do math. Come into the center, go into the camera, do some math problems. I see how your brain does math. I can see how some kids do math better than others. I can have you read something, and I can see how your brain reads. And I can see dyslexia, because it's a reversal of others, right? I can see the manifestation. So we can see a lot. We can have you come in and tell us something you did five years ago. And I can see that part of your brain activate, right where that memory is. Here's an interesting study we did. We took identical twins, identical twins, brought them to our imaging center. One of them stayed in a room two floors up doing whatever he or she was doing. The other one came to the imaging center, right, they're two floors apart, came to the imaging center, went into the camera, and we said, Tell me something you and your sibling did together. Something you guys did, I don't care, three years ago, but you had to do it together. And they talk for eight minutes and we hear the story. We then have the sibling come down, right? And I see in the brain, the person when he told me, I see in the brain that center activates. Right? That's the memory from the kid who just told me what they did. Then I bring the kid down from two floors. She gets in the camera same part of her brain is activated. She didn't tell me the story. She didn't know what the story was being told. Yet that part of her brain activated from her brother or sister twin telling me the story. It's one of the things I've never forgotten in those studies. You know how they talk about how twins can kind of feel and think like the other one? This is a direct evidence that there's clearly something going on between the brains of twins. And you can see it with a PET scan. So, I've never forgotten that. It's something that we've always wanted to pursue, but it was something, that's the power of the tool. Now we're gonna use it to look at addiction. The three images you see up here are normal controls, all three normal people, but their PET scans are really different. On the left, this is a five-day-old baby. I put babies in there because elementary school kids tell me constantly that they remember the day they were born. There isn't anyone in here, there isn't anyone on the planet who can remember the day you were born. I don't care if you think you can. Maybe you dreamed you could. Maybe you hallucinated you could. You can't. Your brain doesn't have the ability to encode a memory when it's born. The two little white spots that you can see, it's part of the brain called the uncus. Its primary role is to allow you to move your mouth. What do babies need to do to survive? They need to nurse. They need to be able to move their mouth. In the middle is my son when he was six years old. Six-year-olds have really active brains, right? The six-year-old brain in the center is really, really active because six-year-old kids have really active brains. To his right is a high school senior. If you're a senior here today, that's what your brain looks like. 
you can see what happens as you age. There's no mystery. As we get older, our brains slow down. Right? There's no mystery to it. But it tells us something that's really important. It tells me that when I look at a 12-year-old methamphetamine abuser, I have to compare that person to a 12-year-old who isn't. I have to compare an 18-year-old to an 18-year-old, a 30-year-old to a 30-year-old. I cannot look at a high school senior smoking pot and compare that to a high school junior smoking pot because their brains change just by age alone. So every image you see today is going to be scanned against or compared to someone the same age. We also have to control for sex. The disease of addiction is more common in women than it is in men. It's also more difficult to treat in women than it is in men. So, not only are we going to control for age, we're going to control for sex. So, the 12-year-old girl who's using meth, amphetamine, is going to be compared to a 12-year-old girl who isn't using meth, amphetamine. And the 9-year-old alcoholic boy is going to be compared to a 9-year-old boy who isn't. So we're controlling for age, and we're controlling for sex. Okay, if you've never seen a PET scanner, that's a PET scanner. It's not terribly impressive. It's obscenely expensive, but not terribly impressive. It's just a box with a hole in it, makes no noise, non-invasive, doesn't hurt, in and out, eight minutes. Okay, so the disease of addiction is caused by a change in the chemical in your brain called dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It's a chemical your brain produces 24-7. You're making it all the time. Because its primary role is movement. Anytime you move anything, right, we have three muscle types. We have striated muscle, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. Those muscles are all controlled by dopamine. Anytime you move any muscle, and you're moving muscles all the time, your heart's beating, you're breathing. Your brain is constantly making dopamine so that can happen. Should you lose dopamine for any reason, a disease, drug abuse, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, whatever, you have trouble moving. That's a disease called Parkinson's. If you've ever heard of Parkinson's disease, it's a movement disorder. Right? If you, Muhammad Ali, most kids remember Muhammad Ali. If you remember him at the 84 Olympics, standing there trying to light the torch, he had these tremors. At the end of his life, he couldn't even speak, let alone chew, because he couldn't move his mouth. Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder that's caused by low dopamine. Next, dopamine is a chemical in your brain that allows you to feel happy or sad. It's really simple. If you're happy, it's because dopamine levels go up. If you're sad, it's because they go down. So we're in a school. You leave this assembly, you go to your next period class, and the teacher hands you a 98 and you're happy that you got a 98, your dopamine levels would go up 4 or 5%. The kid sitting next to you gets a 10 on the same test. Right? Dopamine levels go down 4 or 5%. The most your dopamine is ever going to move is 4 or 5%. Because if it goes up 8 or 9%, schizophrenia. If it goes down 8 or 9%, you can't move. So your brain controls dopamine, it's really simple. You will not move your dopamine levels much more than 4 or 5% unless you use an addictive substance. Every addictive substance raises brain dopamine levels. It's real simple. So let's do that analogy. The kid who gets the 98 in a math test, he or she, your dopamine goes up 4 or 5%. Then at the end of the day, they want to celebrate that test by drinking some alcohol. So they fill a shot glass with tequila and they take a shot. Right. What happens? Dopamine levels go up about 20,000%, 21,000%. So that's a typical response to an acute dose of alcohol 20,000 times greater than anything you'll experience. It's simple. Every addictive drug works by increasing dopamine. And the degree to which they increase dopamine tells us how addictive it is. So the kid who gets a 98 in a test, his buddy gets a 98, once takes a shot of tequila, the other uses a little meth. The one who uses meth, it goes up 910,000 to 1.3 million percent. Methamphetamine raises dopamine levels in six orders of magnitude, over a million times. Most addictive drug we've ever seen. On the left side of the scale is caffeine. 
about 100 percent. So it's real simple. If a drug raises dopamine levels, it's addictive. Period. Really simple. The degree to which it does tells us how addictive it is. Okay. That's brain dopamine. Dopamine eyes on top. That's where your dopamine is. It's in the middle of your brain on both sides, right and left. That's your brain dopamine. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of a study that was done over 100 years ago. It's called conditioned response. We know that the number one reason kids take an addictive substance more than once is because of the cues, the triggers, that cause it. All that means is if you get high with your friend and you see your friend in a few days, that's your cue to use again. So the question is, can we look at somebody and can we tell, one, if they're addicted to anything, and two, how addicted they are? So here's what we did. We went out and we got a bunch of high school kids who smoke pot. Not hard to find. <laughs> we bring them to our imaging center. They don't know why they're there. We just tell them we need people who are using pot to come to the imaging center to volunteer in a study looking at the effects of pot on the human brain. We get thousands of volunteers. We bring them to the imaging center, and the question is always, are they telling us the truth? Are they really smoking pot? How much are they smoking pot? How are they smoking it daily? Are they smoking it once a week? Do we have a method? Can we come up with the dose they're getting? So here's what we do. We put them in a PET scanner, and we measure their brain dopamine, and there it is. Then we say, you know, there's this whole conditioned response thing. Right, Pavlov, he feeds the dog a piece of meat, then a couple days later he feeds the dog a piece of meat and rings a bell. Then a couple days later he rings the bell, the dog salivates. That's called a conditioned response. So it means, that's a dopamine event. It means that if you're truly addicted to something, then when you see it, or when you hear it, or when you smell it, then you should get a response similar to it. Right? The dog hears the bell, so he knows he's going to get meat, so he salivates. So now I take my people who say they're using pot, I put them in the PET scanner, and I show them a photograph of the beach. I get, there's their dopamine. Then I show them a cigarette, tobacco. No change in brain dopamine. They say they don't smoke, they don't use any nicotine. Normal response. Then I show them a blunt, and their dopamine levels go way up. So, here's the deal. We know that if you are using a substance that is by definition addictive, then we know we can see your conditioned response to it. It's not rocket science. It's incredibly consistent. It's strikingly reproducible. And it's unbelievably specific. So we had a college kid working with us. And she said, you know, why don't we have those kids bring in photographs of the kid or friend they use with? So if you smoke pot with your buddy, you come to the imaging center and bring me a photograph of your buddy. I don't need to know his name. I don't want to see his name. I just want a picture of the kid that you're using with. I show them the picture of the kid they're using with. I get the same response. What does it mean? It means that the number one cause of relapse, the number one reason people continue to use addictive substances is because they continue to get cued by the people they use with. If you use an addictive substance with a person, that person becomes the greatest cue to you using it again. The other thing we hear a lot is music. People get high listening to music, whatever it is. And then in a day or two or three or a week, they hear that music, there's their cue. There's a commercial on TV now running. It's a commercial for cruise ships. And it plays a song back from the 60s. It's 
a Janis Joplin song. You don't know Janis Joplin. But anyway, we continue to get phone calls from people who are relapsing because of that music that they listened to back in the 60s. We did a show called 60 Minutes because of the stuff we were doing. And one of the things we told 60 Minutes was, when you advertise the show, do not show drugs. You know, you've got this whole thing coming up, the science of addiction, we're going to show you what goes on in the brain. It's called the B-roll. Don't show drugs. What do you think they did? They showed drugs. We got inundated with calls for people who relapsed just by seeing the lead into the 60 minute story. All it means is, if you get addicted to something, the number one reason you'll continue to do it is because of the cues that you experience as a consequence of doing it. If you get high with your friend, your friend is going to be the greatest cue to cause relapse. Okay, so, we've been dealing with this big issue. When I was in medical school back in the early 80s, medical school is four years. I saw three kids die in four years from a drug overdose. Today, in 2019, we lose eight kids an hour, 192 kids a day. The greatest risk to your life today is drug abuse. Something's going on, right? When I was in medical school, I saw less than a kid a year die. Now I see eight kids an hour die, 192 a day. Something's going on. So we've been looking. I hear all kinds of stuff. I hear Donald Trump. I hear global warming. You know, I hear everything. It's because of some comet somewhere. It's because of the Patriots winning all the Super Bowl. I hear everything I hear. We know one of the reasons. It's this. <laughs> That's twice what you see from meth. 
it's four times what you see for cocaine. In fact, just this week, Canada filed a lawsuit against the creators of Fortnite, claiming that it has the same addictive liability as cocaine. The truth is, it's four times more addictive than cocaine. So, when we look at the data, there's our control, there's our Fortnite response. So let's give you the next piece. You got a question? You're going to have to yell. Yeah, does that mean that cocaine is better for you than like Fortnite? <laughs> does it mean that cocaine is better for you than Fortnite? So let's answer the question. Let's answer the question. He asks, does it mean that cocaine is better for you than Fortnite? So I'm going to just assume we're talking about the disease of addiction. Here's the deal. Of the people who use cocaine, only about 8% ever get addicted. Of the people who use Fortnite, over 91% get addicted. <laughs> so let's look at the next step. Here's the next piece of data. If I now look at if I take 10th and 11th graders, these are controls. The probability that a 10th grader or 11th grader will graduate high school addicted to a chemical substance is on the order of 10 to 14 percent. One in 10. That's about the probability that a kid gets out of high school addicted to something. One in 10. If I look at 10th or 11th graders, who are playing Fortnite up to four and a half hours a day, more than 80% will show chemical dependency by the time they get out of high school. So the single greatest predictor for chemical dependency in high school are these games. We met with the people who wrote the code, right? Because we were addiction people, we were, you know, what's going on? It turns out two of the six creators for Fortnite are addiction psychiatrists like me. What they did was designed it to be addictive. And the way they did it was they integrated artificial intelligence into the games. It's the only two games that are out there now that contain AI. The game learns as you play it. And as you play it, the game modifies the rate of response based on the way you play it. In other words, it delays. That's a learning process, and the game learns as you play. It's an addictive process, and it works. So you just got to be aware. The single greatest predictor for chemical dependency from high school are these video games. We've seen, I've never seen anything like it. One more piece of data. Every one of my chemical protocols, we have about 200 spots a year to study, so 200 people for alcohol, 200 people for cocaine, 200 people for heroin. When I open one of those protocols up, I'll get about 2,000 volunteers in a month. I got 200 spots, 2,000 people will volunteer each month. When we opened up the Fortnite protocol, we got 19,000 in the first hour. That's how many people were interested in getting on. So I'm just, the data are the data. You can choose to believe it or not. We've never seen anything this addictive that's a behavior, and it happens to be consistent with what we're seeing in the disease of addiction. Nothing predicts chemical dependency greater than these games. Next, cell phones. We wanted to look at the addictive liability of cell phones. Right? We hear it all the time. So what we did was we went out and we got about 5,200 kids. And we broke them into two groups. One group uses iPhones. I use an iPhone. One group uses Android. <laughs> We brought them to our imaging center and we put them in the camera, blinded, had them hold their hand out, we put the iPhone in the kids who were iPhone users, the Android in the kids who were Android users, about a 22,000% increase. It doesn't mean that phones are addictive, there's no mystery to that. Then we switched it around. The iPhone kids got Androids, the Android kids got iPhones, no response. 
So it's specific to your phone. Then we took the case off the phone and the iPhone kids got their iPhones and the Android they have without a case. No response. You get addicted to your phone the way it feels. It's the case, the tactile sensation of the phone that has got the highest addictive liability. Well, guess what? Yesterday they published this in the Times. Kids who are addicted to their cell phones are now seeking treatment in detox. So we know it's addictive. But the problem with these two things combined, the games and the cell phones, is they now make Fortnite play on a phone addictive. If you play those games on a platform that's addictive, the addictive liability goes up. Next, we wanted to look at the effects of caffeine on the brain. Right, I see your problem. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is it always what? Yeah, uh, to the phone, yes. To the phone, yes. They get addicted to their phone. It's a great job you're asking. Oh, good question. Not necessarily. Doesn't mean that not necessarily. So the question is, does it mean that you're good if you're addicted to the phone? Not necessarily. It's a high correlation. Correlations are like 0.82, which means if you have a 22,000% increase, are you addicted to your phone? You have a very high probability, but it's not absolute. Right? None of these things are absolute. It's just a correlation, a high correlation. Okay. So I talked to these kids about Fortnite. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. It's a great question. What about when they're actually playing the game? So, here's the data. I take the kid who's using methamphetamine. Her dopamine levels are going up about between 900 and a million times. I show her meth, and it goes up about 50,000 times. I take the kid who's playing Fortnite. I show him Fortnite, and it goes up about 90, 91,000 times. Now the kid plays Fortnite about 1.8 million times, right? So much higher than, we've never seen anything like it. I, just, I told the group before, we had a sixth grader whose mom had reached the end. The kid was playing Fortnite and she acutely took the platform away from the kid. The kid killed her. The kid killed his mother. Right? So, it's the consequence of being so good So next, let's look at one of the things that's very, that we have to deal with. So when we talk, when we talk to young kids who are playing 10, 12, 14 hours a day, and I hear all the time, and I hear all the time that they're using caffeine, right? So we wanted to look at the effect of caffeine. Right? I go to elementary schools and I see fifth graders with their spiced latte, pumpkin latte. So we know that this whole caffeine thing is getting younger and younger. So we wanted to look at caffeine. We went out and we got a whole bunch of kids and we brought them to our imaging center on a Monday morning and took a picture of their brain. And there's their Monday morning PET scan Average age of these kids is just under 17. Monday morning, pet scan. Then I hand them one can of Monster to drink. Now, kids who drink Monster tend to drink 2.3 cans a day. I gave them one can. They had one can of Monster to drink. They had 30 minutes to drink it. And then they had another pet scan. There's their brain. Right. So. That's the effect of caffeine on the brain. Then I brought the kids back the next day. Right, so they came Monday morning, they got a PET scan, they had their monster, they got a PET scan, and they left, and they came back Tuesday morning, 
They went right into the camera. I didn't give them anything. They just climbed into the next PET scan, and there's their brain. So here's the deal. We've all known this, but now we know how long. Every addictive drug, every behavior that's addictive changes your brain for a lot longer than it makes you feel. Caffeine, a single dose will change your brain for about 36 hours. A single dose. Yet, you don't feel the effects of caffeine for 36 hours. So what does it mean? It means you use more caffeine. That's how the disease progresses. An addictive drug produces an increase in brain dopamine, that makes it addictive. But the reason you get addicted is because you use that drug within a time period that's shorter than the recovery. Pot, about 18 days. Opiates, about 14 days. Caffeine, a day and a half, 36 hours. Alcohol, five to seven days. The reason that people get addicted is because they use the same substance in a period of time that's shorter than the recovery time. There's something else going on. When your brain is like this with caffeine, if you use any other addictive substance, that substance becomes more addictive. So, you guys know what this stuff is? We've been talking to kids on the island for decades. And now what kids will say to me all the time is they drink coffee during the week so they can get do other stuff on the weekend and not worry about the caffeine effect. But the caffeine effect is a day and a half. So if you drink coffee on Friday and you do something else, smoke, alcohol, whatever, Saturday, you're still getting the caffeine effect. So just be aware. The caffeine effect is a cute dose of about a day and a half. So if you add caffeine to any other addictive drug, it becomes more addictive. Okay, tobacco, simple. In the middle of your brain is a compound called monoamine oxidase. There it is. If you consume a tobacco product, it goes away. Right, simple. Smoke cigarettes, smoke a cigar, chew tobacco, hookah, whatever. You consume tobacco, you destroy this chemical in your brain. It's dose dependent. 17 year old boy. Normal MAO, one pump on a cigarette, three pumps, one cigarette, three cigarettes. Go on. Unfortunately, if you're exposed to secondhand smoke, it goes away too. So there isn't anyone in this room, myself included, who hasn't lost an MAO because we've all been exposed to secondhand smoke. The good news is, it comes back. It takes about 55 days and it comes back. The bad news, that's the chemical that regulates the amount of dopamine you have in your brain. So when you get exposed to secondhand smoke or you grow, or you're using a tobacco product, you're destroying monoamine oxidase, all other drugs become more addictive. The biggest problem with it is this. The single greatest predictor for first time drug use is the presence of secondhand smoke. If you go to a party and you're at that party and you're just hanging out, you're doing nothing, but you're breathing in secondhand tobacco smoke, you're losing your monoamine oxidase. In about 60 minutes, you'll have lost it all. And in about 75 minutes, your dopamine levels will go up. If you then use something that's addictive, that something becomes more addictive. So just be aware, secondhand, pots, secondhand tobacco smoke is the single greatest predictor for first time drug use. That's a nightmare for people like me. Because now we have the data that says, now we know why we're seeing more people showing up having substance abuse issues. Part of it is because their environments with secondhand smoke. So the solution to the problem with tobacco was this. Now, Let's just cut right to the chase. Vaping was designed for two reasons. One, we want to get people to stop smoking cigarettes. Two, we've got to get rid of the MAO effect. Because the MAO effect is causing people to start using other substances. The data. The people who successfully transitioned from tobacco products to vaping devices is less than 1%. So not terribly effective. The MAO data. Work like a champ. 
If you use a vaping device, vaping nicotine, your MAO does not get altered. You smoke a tobacco product, it does. So the vaping device worked for managing the MAO effect. But you all know what's going on with the vaping devices. Let's just look at the data. This is lung tissue from the kid who just died in Westchester from vaping. He never, just so we're all the data, just so we know, he never tested positive for THC. So, the reason I say that is because kids tell me all the time the problem with vaping is the kids who are putting the chemicals, the THC oils, the wax and all that, this kid never did. This is tissue from his lungs. You shouldn't see a single black dot on that slide, not one. It's not a slide where you can say, well, you should see three or four. You should see none. Those black dots are lipid droplets, oil. If you vape, doesn't matter what you're vaping, juices, Poland Springs water, all liquids have oils in them. Oils are perfectly fine to consume PO by mouth because they go into your stomach and your stomach has bile and pepsin that breaks fats down. It's not okay to breathe in oils because when you breathe in oils, they get into your lungs and they start to coat your lungs. This kid suffocated over six or seven days. If you vape, doesn't matter what you're vaping, you're getting these oils in your lungs. You have no mechanism to get rid of oil in your lungs. You have all kinds of mechanisms to get rid of oil in your gut, but nothing in your lungs. What happens is those oils coat your lung. And over time, you have trouble breathing. And you develop what's called a lipoid pneumonia. That's what's killing you. And it doesn't matter what you're vaping. And the question someone asked me in the other group, secondhand vape does the same thing. So if you're in a room with people vaping, the person vaping is getting the biggest dose, but people in the room are also getting the dose. And again, Right? If you vape THC oil, it's worse. But if you just vape the juices, how do you get a juice to stay in suspension? You do emulsifier. Emulsification is fat. So all the juices have fats in them. Look at the label. Emulsification. Right? So just be aware. The next problem we run into is this. Every vaping device works the same way. So we got the chemistry issue, the lightweight stuff. Now we have the physics issue. Every baking device works the same way. You take a piece of metal, you heat it up. Liquid heat hits that piece of heated metal, turns into a vapor. It's actually an aerosol. You breathe it in. What happens? When you heat metal and you expose a liquid to it, that metal fractures. You do it every day in your kitchen. Look at the pots in your kitchen. The pot bottoms don't look the same. Why? Because you heat them up and you put a liquid in them and it causes the metal to crack. So the bottoms of the pots look different because they have micro cracks. <coughs> Vaping device is the same thing. The liquid hits that piece of heated metal, that metal fractures. That means now, what's the metal? Well, the metal in every vaping device is an alloy of nickel, chromium, and cadmium. If you go and you look at the OSHA website for toxic metals, number one is lead, number three is cadmium. When you vape, independent of what you vape, you're getting nanoparticles, 10 to the minus nine meters, small, of nickel, chromium, and cadmium in your lungs. They pass through your lungs. They get trapped in your kidney. Your kidney chelates metals. What does it mean? It means that over the next four to seven years, people who vape, we're going to start to see kidney failure. We're already seeing it. In my district, we've got a 16-year-old kid who has five days a week, six hours a day, getting kidney dialysis because his kidneys no longer work. If you vape, the big problem, the acute problem, is lung failure. The chronic problem, kidney failure. It doesn't matter what you're vaping. Just so you're aware, just so you know, when you vape, you're getting lipoid pneumonia, droplets in your lungs, and you're getting deposits of metals in your kidneys. We used to think that the way to treat nicotine addiction was to transition people to vaping devices. What you're going to see is vaping devices go away because one, it doesn't work, it's less than a percent. And two, now we have big talent, right? We're up to just over 500 kids dying from vaping. And the death is horrible. That kid died over six to seven days and suffocated. Okay, next, alcohol. <laughs> 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 the 
got it from methamphetamine in her house, and she ate it. In about six months, she ended up in what's called a vegetative state. Blind, deaf, curled into a fetal position, where she has lived since. My daughter Brittany is now 30, and Jennifer is 30. Her six-year-old sister was in the same condition. Methamphetamine is a strikingly neurotoxic drug. It means it kills brain dopamine cells on contact. She gave herself Parkinson's disease from a single dose. Here's the next problem. When I get a hundred kids who test positive for methamphetamine, they test positive in urine, blood, and hair. So I know there's meth in them. And I ask them to fill out a blind survey, right, no name, list the drugs you've used. Over 90% of them leave methamphetamine off. I'll see alcohol, maybe I'll see pot. There's no meth. Very few people actually put that. So what does it mean? I mean, well, some of them lied to me. You know, it's my business, I know that. They didn't all lie to me. It turns out methamphetamine has the highest rate of uninformed use. What does it mean? That means the vast majority of people who test positive for meth don't know they're getting it. What does that mean? That means it's showing up someplace. It's showing up in pot. People who are smoking pot, there's an amount of pot that's out there now, depending on what group you look at, between 62% and 71% of the pot on the street has methamphetamine in it. So we test for it. That's what we do. Right? We look. And sure enough, we work with NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and we look. We go out and sample pot in the Northeast Corridor, Washington, D.C. to Boston. And we're seeing huge contamination rates of the pot with methamphetamine. Ten years ago, methamphetamine wasn't in pot. We never saw it. The pot was laced with something called the angel dust, PCP. Now you don't see that anymore. Now you see meth. So what does it mean? It means that if that's really true, then we should start seeing kids show up with Parkinson's disease. Well, last year, the group in St. Louis decided to look at just that phenomenon, and they took 425 eighth graders. These are kids who were 14 years old, smoking pot. 26% tested positive for signs of Parkinson's disease. The youngest reported case of Parkinson's is 26. We don't see it in kids who are 14, unless it's drug-induced. So, all we want to tell you is that the pot that's out there has methamphetamine in it more often than it doesn't. Where I live on the island, there's a little village called Wading River. It's on the North Shore. Last summer, they caught kids with 22 pounds of meth and huge bricks of pot and a salad mixer. And they were mixing pot and sprinkling meth into it. So, you just have to be aware. The contamination rates of methamphetamine in pot are enormous. The biggest problem we have with pot, the reason, you know, when you hear all this stuff about there's not a lot of science behind pot, you know, one of the reasons is because it's really hard to find just pure pot. For the last 50 years, the pot that was out there had angel dust in it. So you couldn't do a study in pot on the street because you had this compound in angel dust. That's why there's not a lot of pot data, because you couldn't find pure pot. Today, angel dust is gone, methamphetamine is replacing it, because it's so cheap. CVS and Home Depot, you can make a whole bunch of it, and it's being put in pot. Now, kids have been telling me on the island for the last five years that they buy their pot, and they dump it out on the table, and they pick the meth crystals out of it. If they're doing that, the problem's worse than I do. I've never seen that. Remember, plants have cell walls. You and I have plasma membranes. We have fossils of cell walls. That means cell walls live. They don't live, they're there forever. You sprinkle some methamphetamine in the pot into the cell wall of the plant, you can't see it. It gets incorporated into the cell wall. So, when I hear kids say to me that they pick the meth out of their pot, if they're doing that, the problem's a lot worse than I thought it was, but you can't see it. So people give you pot, or you know people smoking pot, and you look at the pot, you're not going to see green crystals, or yellow crystals, or pink crystals. It's incorporated into the cell wall, and you can't see it. 
So we're just asking people to be aware. It's a big problem. If you just look at in this frame, you're going to see a big report in 60 minutes of the neurochemical damage caused by marijuana laced with methamphetamine. So one of the kids asked me in the other group, if you're in a room and someone smoked a pot with meth in it, are you also getting the same effect? Yeah, you are. Secondhand pot smoke, right? So just be aware. Secondhand pot smoke does the same thing as pot smoking, different dose, right? It's a rule of thumb, it's about one fifth. The person smoking pot is getting some damage. The person sitting next to him is getting one fifth the rate. So just be aware. You know people smoking pot, you know that there's pot out there, right? There it is. It's got methamphetamine in it, I guarantee it. It's really becoming a much bigger problem. So I'll end there. Ask, answer any questions anyone has about anything, any drugs we didn't talk about. You guys have any questions about anything?